safely resume our in-person meetings. I want to take a moment to thank Chief McCullough, his executive leadership team and uniform and civilian members of the Niagara Regional Police Services, who have been working diligently at times under difficult circumstances. I also want to thank everyone for joining us today, Niagara Region residents, members of the media, and Niagara Region Police staff who are watching online. Thank you for your support and staying connected. With that said, I'm going to proceed with today's agenda. Although this meeting is taking place online, we acknowledge the land we are on as we hold this meeting is the traditional territory of First Nations peoples. In particular, we recognize and thank the Haudenosaunee and Anishinaabe peoples for their stewardship of these lands over the millennia. We also recognize the contribution of Métis, Inuit, and other Indigenous people, both in shaping and strengthening this region, in particular in our province and our country as a whole. I'll now go into roll call. Member Eek, just please state I'm here. Unmute, unmute yourself. Uh, present, thank you. Member D'Angelo. Here. Member McKendrick. Here. Member Gale. Here. Member Gibson. Present. Okay. Uh, right now we have the minutes of the previous uh, meetings. There's one set of minutes, the minutes of the board meeting held Thursday, September 24th, 2020, moved by member D'Angelo, seconded by member Eek, that the minutes of the public board meeting held Thursday, September 24th, 2020, be adopted and circulated. Any question with these minutes, members? Anyone against this? So that's carried. Now on to reports. And first I'll do the report from the chair. On October 27th, Member Eek uh, will participate in the virtual joint region and police facilities accommodations steering committee meeting. The committee is also scheduled to meet on November 24th and further updates will be provided as the project advances. Specific to the new one district St. Catharines police facility, members of the board and service attended the location on October the 2nd for a tour and a firsthand look at the progression that has been made. It's important to note that attendees at the tour were limited and in keeping with COVID-19 guidelines regarding the number of people allowed at social gatherings. Build's completion remains on track with an anticipated move-in date of mid-February of 2021. There's a full report providing a status update in this project, which is listed as item number 157 on today's agenda. Um, Member Eek, is there anything you'd like to add about the uh, tour or the uh, location uh, or station one? Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair. It certainly was a, a very an informative tour. And as you mentioned, it was limited due to COVID-19 to 10 people as a gathering. And uh, of course you were there along with the chief and other members of the service and our, and our board. Uh, it was interesting uh, to learn from uh, Nicole Menard, who is the manager for construction of this new facility on Welland Avenue, which will be the new uh, one district police station for St. Catharines. We went room by room and it was really interesting and the explanation of how the building design incorporated the, the needs and flow for an efficient uh, uh, workstation and workplace. As well, we observed the, the types of materials that were used again to uh, be efficient and effective in the maintaining of this site. And uh, it really, give us and, and put in play the reality that uh, this site will will be substantially completed by the end of this year and it is anticipated that uh, there will be a move in in the month of february 2021 so i would like to thank uh, ms menard for an excellent tour that was provided and a reassurance to the public that uh, I don't believe we saw any deficiencies or anything that uh, was askew from impacting a very efficient and, and flow uh, to the site. And uh, again, thank you very much to him and to the members that took the opportunity to uh, view this, this tour. Thank you very Great. much. Thank you, David, appreciate that. Uh, Canadian Association of Police Governance, the CAPG, is hosting its 2020 annual conference 
virtually from October 30th to November 2nd. This year's theme is entitled Prioritizing Wellness Through Governance. Agenda topics will focus on current and emerging issues in policing and will include relevant and thought leading presentations, opportunities for conversation and dialogue, and an opportunity to hear from engaging experts. All board members are registered for the conference and members are encouraged to participate in the virtual sessions being offered. On November the 10th at 12 p.m., the CAPG will be hosting its monthly webinar as part of its educational strategy to keep police boards and police executives across uh, Canada apprised of issues currently impacting the policing community. This month's webinar is entitled Training and Knowing Your Board Authority. Webinar details will be circulated shortly for those members who wish to participate. On November the 12th and 13th, from 9 a.m. to 12 p.m., the Ontario Association of Police Services Board will be hosting its annual labor seminar virtually. Virtual information sessions are designed to provide police board members and staff with updates on the labor relations landscape across Ontario. To educate boards uh, about police executive contracts and to discuss current employer challenges associated with WSIB. Members interested in participating in the seminar are asked to confirm with board staff no later than November the 6th. Our next meeting uh, will be held Thursday, November 12th, uh, and the next board meeting, or sorry, that's the next committee meeting, and our next board meeting will be held uh, Thursday, November the 26th, starting at 9 a.m., and those, again, are virtual. Any questions uh, with regards to the chair's report? Seeing none, moving on to Chief McCullough. Uh, for the Chief's report. Uh, good morning and thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, I'll first, uh, provide an update with regards to uh, the continuing COVID-19 situation. Um, our police service continues uh, to manage and adapt to the ever-changing reality of the COVID-19 pandemic and the impact it's having uh, both on our community and our members. Uh, with the increased community spread of the uh, COVID-19 virus uh, on October 10th of this year, the Government of Ontario reverted Toronto, Peel and Ottawa back to stage two of the province's framework to recovery plan. Also on this date, the government imposed some additional restrictions uh, to areas that remain in stage three, including the Niagara region, uh, which included limiting the hours of operation for licensed uh, establishments, bars, and restaurants to serve liquor uh, and remain open, open to the public. <clears throat> Excuse me. Additionally, on October the 19th, York Region uh, was also reverted back to stage two. Uh, further, the province has once again extended the emergency orders uh, currently in place under the Reopening Ontario Act. Uh, until November 21st of 2020. Up until now, uh, I've been able to report uh, to the board that uh, no members of the Niagara Regional Police Service uh, had tested positive for COVID-19. Unfortunately, I'm unable to report that, uh, uh, that same information today. Uh, on October 10th, we had our first member of the service test positive. And then again on October the 15th, we had a second member test positive for COVID-19. Uh, at this time, there's no evidence to suggest that these two cases are linked. Uh, both members are self-isolating and remain at home recovering. Uh, we've worked very closely with Niagara Region Public Health to ensure that contact tracing is conducted and that anyone was, that was deemed to have been in close contact with the affected members uh, have been contacted by public health and provided uh, specific instructions. Uh, further, as a proactive measure, a deep cleaning of any affected area was completed. Uh, we have and continue to stress uh, to members that if they're not feeling well, even mildly symptomatic, uh, that they cannot be in the workplace. This is uh, unfortunately the new reality for our entire community and province. Uh, on October 16th, uh, in light of the increasing rate of COVID-19 uh, numbers nationally, provincially, and locally, um, the service uh, enacted additional measures to prevent the spread of infection. Uh, this included the wearing of face coverings or masks by all members while inside all Niagara Regional Police Service facilities, uh, except when they're seated in their specific work area, 
which has uh, been appropriately distanced from their co-workers. Um, in the near future, we'll be issuing cloth masks to all members. Uh, in the interim, members can choose to wear their own cloth mask or wear a surgical mask. Uh, the new face covering or masking policy has been put in place to safeguard our members uh, and the workplace in accordance with best practices and public health guidance. Uh, further to support the efforts of public health officials, the messaging uh, from the government continues to emphasize a stronger enforcement approach rather than an educational approach uh, that has been stressed in the past. Um, life within our region continues to be far from normal and the provincial and public health authorities continue to stress physical distancing, frequent hand washing, uh, good respiratory etiquette, the wearing of face coverings or masks uh, when distancing cannot be achieved and encouraging people to stay home when ill. Uh, we as a service continue to encourage members to observe these same safety measures uh, both in the workplace uh, as well as in their personal lives when off duty. Our pandemic uh, business continuity committee continues to meet regularly to adapt our methods as needed uh, the service continues to be vigilant and methodical in our approach to ensure the safety of all of our members. Uh, we'll, of course, be flexible and adaptable to the changing circumstances uh, based on a combination of government and health, public health direction. And we'll continue to closely monitor uh, what's taking place in our community. Uh, the service continues to work closely with our emergency services partners at uh, uh, all of the fire services and EMS, uh, the local area municipalities, the region, public health, uh, in participating in the emergency operations center uh, to help us uh, guide us through uh, these evolving times. Uh, included with this mutual cooperation framework, we continue to assist municipal bylaw enforcement officers in ensuring compliance of emergency orders. I want to again thank uh, our local area municipalities, in particular their enforcement personnel, uh, in continuing to manage and deal with this uh, ever-changing situation of, of government orders uh, being imposed uh, and in responding to the various issues and concerns uh, identified within the community. Uh, the Niagara Regional Police Service to date uh, has issued five provincial offense notices for failing to comply with the orders. I can further advise that uh, we've received a total of uh, 1,192 COVID-19 specific calls for service uh, related to the Emergency Management and Civil Protection Act uh, or the Reopening of Ontario Act orders. Uh, as it pertains to personal protection equipment or PPE, uh, our service continues to maintain an adequate supply of N95 and surgical masks, gloves, hand sanitizer and wipes. Uh, the supply chains for PPE continues to, to be monitored and, and assessed to ensure that we're well positioned uh, for any future possibilities. Since the uh, start of the pandemic back in March, uh, the service has been able to maintain adequate staffing levels uh, and we've not had to cancel uh, any scheduled time off for members. In terms of uh, calls for service, uh, we're currently trending at or near pandemic, uh, pre-pandemic level, sorry. Uh, this has been the case now for uh, over five months now. We saw an initial decrease, but those numbers have uh, continued to uh, um, uh, revert to uh, pretty much uh, uh, normal pre-pandemic levels. There's no significant deviation for calls uh, for service in respect to any geographic area within the region uh, or in relation to any particular vulnerable group or any serious uh, breaches of the peace related to the pandemic. Uh, in an effort to safeguard and ensure that our members have the most current uh, and accurate information, I've sent out uh, a total of 53 uh, updates in, in uh, mass mail email, email messages uh, additionally, I continue to host virtual town hall meetings when necessary uh, as another means of ensuring uh, that I'm sharing the most uh, up-to-date information uh, with our members on the uh, 
on the pandemic. All members of the service, sworn and civilian, um, have done an outstanding job during this really unprecedented challenge, and I can't thank our members enough uh, for their continued dedication and professionalism uh, as they continue to serve our community. Uh, we're seeing the current uptick of uh, COVID cases within the Niagara region as well as in the province, and uh, now is certainly not the time to become complacent. We must all continue to do our part to be vigilant and closely following the guidelines of public health officials. Uh, just some information about our recent uh, recruit graduation. Uh, on June 5th, uh, 18 new recruit constables commenced their careers with the Niagara Regional Police Service, uh, starting with day one in their our training unit. Uh, they received approximately two weeks of introductory prep preparation um, by virtual means uh, in light of the, the ongoing pandemic. And then on June 24th, our recruits attended the Ontario Police College for 10 weeks of COVID-19 modified intensive training. All trainees uh, successfully completed their uh, OPC training and uh, the 18 recruits returned to Niagara uh, to resume their in-house training on September 2nd. On September 25th, a uh, re recruit graduation ceremony was held uh, at the training unit for their members. Uh, again, the ceremony was modified and conducted by virtual means uh, in order to maintain compliance with uh, various COVID uh, related orders. Uh, on September 27th, all 18 recruits began their training with a coach officer in the field. I want to extend my congratulations to all the new constables uh, on this achievement and, and we certainly wish them a long and successful career with the uh, with the police service. Uh, their members and families should all be extremely proud of, uh, of this accomplishment. Uh, on June 18th, the Niagara Regional Police Service uh, responded to Preakness Street in Niagara Falls regarding an assist ambulance call for service. I'm uh, sorry, this uh, is in regards to an SIU closure. Um, uh, Niagara EMS uh, advised that a 39-year-old female um, who appeared to be under the influence of drugs had fallen and may have sustained a head injury. Uh, upon arrival, officers stood by while paramedics tended to the female. Uh, the female suddenly ran from the area and uh, while ran, rounding a nearby SUV fell and sustained an obvious injury to her left leg. As a result uh, of a totality of circumstances, the female was apprehended under the Mental Health Act, uh, transported the female to local hospital for assessment where she was diagnosed uh, with an injury that would fit the mandate of the SIU. The SIU was notified and invoked their mandate to investigate. One constable was designated as a subject officer and one constable was designated as a witness officer by the SIU. On October 6, our service received notification from SIU Director Joseph Martino. Uh, in his closure letter, he advised that the SIU had concluded their investigation and that there were no grounds for criminal charges against any of uh, the involved officers. The SIU uh, Director further concluded that uh, the involved officers acted with tact, professionalism, kindness, and compassion uh, for the female's plight at the time of the incident. Uh, just with regards to our uh, 2020 homicide uh, investigations, uh, during the, um, the reporting period of September 23rd to October 20th, uh, we had one homicide. We didn't have any attempted uh, murders during this uh, same time frame. Uh, so year to date, we have uh, four homicides uh, thus far in 2020 and three attempted uh, homicides. Uh, comparatively in 2019, we had seven for the entire year and uh, two attempted homicides, uh, two homicides in 2018, three homicides in 2017, and one homicide in 2016. Little information regarding that, uh, that homicide. On Friday, October 2nd, um, three, three district uniform officers responded to the area of Highway 20 in Cream Street in the town of Pelham for a welfare check. Uh, once on scene, officers 
located a 74 year old male with serious injuries. The male was subsequently pronounced deceased at the scene. Uh, due to the circumstances, uh, members of the homicide unit took carriage of the investigation. Investigators believe that the victim may have interrupted an attempted theft on the nearby property and that a suspect vehicle uh, was also involved in this incident. On November 9th, investigators arrested a 39-year-old male for the offense of second-degree murder. And then again, on October 10th, a 49-year-old male was arrested uh, as it pertain pertains to this matter and likewise uh, charged this individual with second-degree murder. Obviously, a, a, a terrible uh, tragedy uh, and uh, this matter is now before the courts. Uh, there was one fatal uh, motor vehicle collision and there were no life-threatening injuries, uh, or, sorry, injury motor vehicle collisions uh, during the month of September. Um, so to date, we have uh, 15 uh, fatal collisions that have occurred in uh, 2020. Comparatively, we had 13 in each of uh, 2018 and 2019, 16 in 2017, 16 in 2016, and 15 in 2015. A little bit of information on that uh, fatal collision. On September the 6th, we responded to a report of a serious motor vehicle collision at Stanley Avenue and Robinson Street in the city of Niagara Falls. Investigation determined that a 53-year-old male was operating a motorcycle uh, southbound on Stanley Avenue approaching Robinson Street. Uh, also at this time, a 52-year-old male was operating a Nissan motor vehicle northbound on Stanley uh, when it commenced a left-hand turn onto Robinson Street. Uh, the motorcycle and Nissan subsequently uh, collided and the operator of the motorcycle was transported to a local hospital by EMS and unfortunately he was uh, uh, later pronounced deceased. Driver of the Nissan did not sustain any physical injury and that collision remains under investigation by our collision reconstruction unit. Sorry, just uh, my computer has frozen, just bear with me. Um, in response to, uh, it's just some items in the news now, in response to uh, complaints of vehicles being operated uh, within the um, uh, city of uh, Niagara Falls uh, re um, regarding excessive noise, uh, our officers stepped up enforcement of uh, motor vehicles with defects or that have been modified to become louder specifically in Niagara Falls and uh, in Niagara and the Lake. Over the course of the initiative, two district uh, uniform officers stopped and inspected vehicles in the city of Niagara Falls and the town of Niagara and the Lake for excessive noise. A total of 52 provincial offense notices were issued for failing to have a muffler, improper mufflers, uh, and unnecessary noise contrary to the Highway Traffic Act. It was intended to uh, that this operation show the public that their complaints over vehicles causing excessive noise were heard loud and clear. Uh, although this particular initiative has ended, the Niagara Regional Police uh, Service will continue our efforts um, uh, in inspecting vehicles causing excessive noise and may lay charges where appropriate uh, all across the region. And I know that there's some correspondence uh, that has come from City of St. Catharines uh, about this initiative and uh, we'll certainly talk about that uh, a little bit later. Um, on October 7th at approximately 10 a.m., uh, eight district officers attended the area of Murray Street and Olive Street in the town of Grimsby in response to a naked male attempting to enter numerous houses in the area. Uh, officers arrived on scene and located the male. One officer, uh, while attempting to ascertain the welfare of the male, was assaulted by this individual. The male again advanced on the officers, resulting in a conducted energy weapon or taser uh, being deployed, uh, which unfortunately was uh, ineffective. Uh, the male continued to resist arrest, then fled on foot and barricaded himself within the residence. Uh, the Niagara Regional 
Police uh, Emergency Task Unit, canine and crisis negotiators attended the scene, contained the residents while attempting to engage with the male and uttered uh, an abundance of caution. A nearby school and daycare were placed on lockdown. At approximately 6.07, the uh, situation came to a peaceful resolution and the 50-year-old male was arrested and charged with two counts uh, of assaulting a police officer. Uh, just um, a matter in regards to a human trafficking investigation. Uh, in June of 2020, detectives from our human trafficking unit with the assistance of our special victims and intelligence units, along with the Halton Regional Police Service Human Trafficking Unit commenced an investigation in relation to a Niagara Falls residence in the area of Buckeye Crescent uh, in Kaler Road. Uh, during the course of that investigation, detectives were able to uh, identify three suspects. On uh, October 16th, detectives executed a warrant at that residence and three suspects were arrested and now facing charges, including kidnapping and forcible confinement. Uh, detectives have reason to believe that there, uh, there are members of the public who may have information in relation to this matter and that there may be additional victims in relation to, the, to human trafficking. Uh, anyone with information is uh, strongly encouraged to contact detectives uh, in our human trafficking unit or of course uh, they can call Crime Stoppers at 1-800-222-8477. And that concludes my uh, report, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Chief McCullough. Questions from board members? Uh, Member Gale. Thank you, uh, Chair. And through you to the Chief. And so the board members don't know I'm, uh, I'm not blindsiding the Chief. The Chief is aware I'm going to ask this question. But Chief, as per my email uh, earlier, I'm asking about the uh, proposed or the letter that the region sent to the federal government about the legalization of uh, personal usage of drugs and that the Canadian Police Chief Association supports this. I'd like you to comment on this to the board members here. Councillors apparently got a letter from you at uh, Public Health. I'm not on Public Health, but uh, if you could expand on this, please, uh, uh, with the support of the Chiefs and what your stance is on this. Thank you. Chief? Uh, through uh, Mr. Chair, uh, I mean, I can say generally speaking, um, many, uh, and but certainly not all police leaders are uh, in support of decriminalization. Um, however, I, what I would say is that the major concern uh, is that there needs to be a really robust support system or support network in place uh, to really um, clearly address all of the four pillars related to uh, drug addiction. And, specifically education, harm reduction, treatment, uh, and enforcement. Um, the Ontario Association of Chiefs of Police uh, is working on a white paper specifically to address um, this issue. Uh, the Canadian Association of Chiefs of Police, which is the national version of the OACP, uh, they released a white paper um, and are, again, supportive um, but with the um, above proviso that there needs to be this robust um, support network in place. Uh, in many jurisdictions, including our own, um, the supports around treatment in particular are lacking. Um, there are um, a number of harm reduction strategies um, that are not necessarily employed consistently uh, across the province and there's also concerns uh, specifically related to organized crime and that they'll further infiltrate the opioid uh, industry uh, more than it has already um, much like we've seen them do with the uh, cannabis uh, industry and, um, and, and that is uh, a significant and legitimate concern uh, I think for our communities and for uh, uh, for law enforcement. Um, our experience uh, with uh, the illegal uh, grows here in, in Niagara um, is that uh, it's been a, a bit of a disappointing response from Health Canada. 
uh, to say the least, um, with respect to their responsibilities to uh, regulate uh, the illegal cannabis industry. Um, and as a result of that, the, um, uh, the cannabis industry, uh, the medical part of the, of the illegal cannabis industry has been significantly exploited by organized crime. And quite frankly, it's, an, it's a multi-billion dollar um, industry now. Uh, if this were to happen with the uh, opioid industry, um, you can uh, just imagine the impact that that would have on our communities in terms of uh, overdoses um, beyond what we're already experiencing uh, and deaths. Um, and that's why um, I'm supportive of decriminalization um, so long as there are those uh, significant uh, support networks in place uh, to be able to regulate uh, and provide uh, the necessary support uh, to, to individuals. So in a nutshell, I th what my feeling is, is that um, we shouldn't put the cart before the horse, um, that um, there is a place for decriminalization, um, but let's get the support uh, supports in place before decriminalization as opposed to vice versa uh, so that it, it can be properly addressed. And that's sure. certainly the, uh, the feelings uh, that I've had or expressed to me from other police chiefs, um, particularly uh, in Northern Ontario and other rural parts of Ontario uh, and across Canada where they don't necessarily have a robust support system in place and the concern is that by decriminalizing, uh, it will make an already uh, difficult situation uh, even more difficult. Member so, Dale? For, so further, this chief, uh, one of the selling factors on decriminalization of marijuana uh, a couple of years ago was that it would cut back, they felt, on organized crime, on street sellers, and that it was more controlled. I take it by your comments, this isn't the way it is right now for that, and that if they don't get control on these heavier drugs, it could blossom like marijuana. Am I correct in saying it that way? Yeah, that's, uh, that's certainly uh, our concern with regards to the, uh, the uh, cannabis industry. Um, there is, um, obviously there's two different types of grow operations. Uh, there's the legal that has been endorsed um, by, uh, by the federal government uh, and they're growing um, so that members of the public can legally acquire cannabis either online or through uh, uh, distribution um, stores. Uh, the problem is, is that organized crime has infiltrated the, the health component or um, area of, uh, of growing uh, cannabis. And um, as a result of that, there's a, a flood of uh, illegal cannabis that has uh, um, entered the market and is um, uh, suffice to say that it is, um, it's organized crime that's, uh, that's running this industry. And, uh, and again, it's a, it's a billion dollar industry. So I'm sorry to continue on this uh, chair, but uh, chief, I just received from a citizen of Niagara Falls, and I received another one this morning, a notice that went around to everybody in the north end of Niagara Falls about a proposed uh, cannabis facility <clears throat> on Mount Mountain Road by Kaler or something. Now it just went to everybody, but I just received another one from a real estate agent saying, Bob, is this true? And I know nothing about it. Do they go to you, the region, or the number one, who gives the permits on this? Number two, do they take your uh, consultation on this? Whoever it is that gives it, is it a region, city, province, what? Uh, through you, Chair, uh, really it depends on the stream and, and um, if it is um, a, um, if it is the legal stream um, for, for supplying cannabis through the federal government uh, to members of the um, public, um, yes, then we are consulted. We are notified when an application is being made. But when it's through the medical stream, no, we're not notified because uh, it's deemed to be uh, personal health information. And as a result of that, um, we're not notified of those situations. 
So, so what does the region or municipality have a say in it at all, or is it always the feds? Um, it's it's regulated at uh, so the the health stream is regulated by Health Canada. And the other one where it's not for health, uh, it's for social usage, if you want to say it. Sure. Is that does anything come to our region or municipality? Is more or less my question. So the uh, again the recreational stream, if we'll call that uh, personal use stream, um, is. Um, uh, police and municipalities uh, are made aware of those applications, um, but the Health Canada stream, um, I don't believe, I know that we are, as police service, are not uh, engaged and not made aware of those applications in advance, uh, and I don't believe the municipalities are either. Okay, so as this complaint was in Niagara Falls, I'm going to go to Jim Diodati and, and ask him to ask his staff does the city have a say on stuff like this? What goes up in their municipalities on that? I'm sorry to put you on the spot, Chief, but I have no idea on this. Who gives the okay on this stuff? So thank you for that, Chief. You're welcome. Thanks, Member Gale. And and the Chief is correct. On the recreational mm -hmm. rural operations, and Bob, you know that Pelham's had a real issue in the last number of years with their large grow ops. Those do come through the municipality because under our site plan control, and our bylaws, we regulate where they can go. There are federal rules behind it, uh, but we are notified and, and we're involved with like the building uh, applications and all that stuff. So the municipality is involved in it, um, but they are legal. Um, they're, they're legal in the agricultural um, area. So I'll, I'll look at Port Coburn because that's what I deal with. In our Ward 4 area, it's, it's legal in the majority of, of that land to to buy a farm and, and grow um, recreational marijuana on a uh, with a uh, with a grow up, the health side, which the chief said, is a real issue for municipalities. We know nothing about these. So if you are allowed a license through Health Canada to grow four plants, you can grow those in your backyard or in a greenhouse, however you decide, on your property. And I know the issue the chief is having and our police department is having, as well as our bylaws department, our building department here in our municipality, as well as I'm sure across the 12 municipalities in Niagara, is that these people get somebody else's license. So Henry could have a license to grow medical marijuana. You may need four plants, but you don't have a way to grow. You can go to Henry and say, Henry, can you grow my four plants too? That's the issue that the chief is talking about where where uh, the criminal element is getting involved and then all of a sudden you go into somebody's backyard and there's hundreds of these plants. And, and, and the whole, it's a whole foggy issue with regards to jurisdiction, how you can deal with it on a policing side, on a bylaws side. So I know within our municipality, we're having huge issues with this medical side of the things. We contact Health Canada and to be quite honest, they wash their hands. They don't, and they, they, they're of very little help. I think they need more teeth in this, uh, not only on the policing side, but on the bylaw side for municipality. Because quite honestly, I think a lot of it we can look after on the bylaw side and probably don't need to involve the police. But if it's getting into a, to a criminal element, obviously the police need to be involved. But it, it, it gets tough out there um, on this stuff, Bob. And I know what you're saying. So. So, so, Chair, I just received an email at this second from somebody that was listening to you and asked me to ask, is there any regulation or any... Uh, control on the smell that goes, because we know the smell devalues houses, goes on forever. Has the government stepped up now, like the cart before the house horse on the on heavy drugs that the chief mentioned, have they got any controls now to make it so uh, uh, the smell has to be controlled? Do you know? Well, they, they yes, they do. However, whether they move forward. So we have a girl off in Port Coburn that, that is, creates a lot of smell. Um, it's under the old licensing system, so it's grandfathered. So the old licensing system allowed them to really vent the, the, the greenhouse into the air. The new licenses, you have to have a whole air control system. So it's a, it's a more expensive venture. Our comment to the feds is the fact that we don't want any grandfathering if, if, if it's a detriment to the community. So whether it's a neighborhood or in Port Coburn's case, it's a, it's an area of our, our rural 
uh, Ward 4, it is a detriment to that neighborhood. And we're just telling the feds, look, we know this is new for you guys, but you've got to move quickly on this. You can't be dragging your feet, and they are. Yeah. Um, so anything new is supposed to have top quality uh, air control systems so that um, none of the smell gets outside. My understanding based on, on one company that was coming, uh, that wanted to come to Port Coleman, they were actually going to build a building within a building. Um, so that all the air circulation, air handling can be handled so that any air that goes outside is actually virtually smell free, or they put some type of perfume in it to actually make it smell like a flower or something like that. So there are issues, but, but you're right. Even I, I've got a huge issue with a, with a medical grow up that just seems to grow and grow and grow. Uh, I don't mean that as a pun, but I mean, you know, they've gone from four plants to it seems like unlimited. Um, our officers have been tied because we've had our officers work with our bylaws, but they flash their medical uh, license and the feds just um, seem to be turning a blind eye to this. Yet the neighborhood that that fellow lives in, and I've been there and it stinks. Like it, it stinks. Like it's not a great smell. You know, I think I said this early on in the game when we all came onto the board, if it smelled like roses, we wouldn't be talking about this. Um, but it doesn't. So, so what you're talking about, Member Gale, is it a, is it a grow op for recreational use or is it a grow op for medical use? Because there are differences, and I think the chief is right on that. There are big differences on how these things operate. So, good, uh, Member Gibson. Thank you, Chair, and through you. So. Um, everything you just said, Bill, I echo completely. We're having lots of problems here in Wingfleet as well. We have, I believe that we're at seven significant grow ops right now. Um, so they do waive that medical license around. Are we doing anything chief in regards to if it's a medical license, are we not even looking at it? Like it's automatically an area we don't go uh, versus a non-medical license. Um, Secondly, are we are we actively pursuing illegal grow ups still, or are they at the kind of the bottom of the food chain in regards to you know the drug uh, our drug teams enforcement? Chief, uh, so through you, Chair, um, you know, quite frankly, um, what we have here is is a is a, a method for people to to infiltrate uh, the illegal groves under the auspice of it being a medical um, license. And to Chair um, Steele's point around four plants, the, the, the reality is they're getting licenses to grow 500 plants as part of a um, medical issue. And there, the courts have weighed in on this and there is case law to support um, individuals to grow their own um, cannabis uh, for a medical purpose. And that further that individuals um, may not necessarily have the ability or the knowledge to grow it themselves uh, so they can go to somebody else to grow it on their behalf. And that's, that is what we're um, experiencing here in Niagara is um, an organization or an individual can grow for up to four people who have medical licenses. So in theory, you could have 2000 plants being grown in, an, in a um, location and farms are being bought up around the region right now. And uh, wherever there's a greenhouse, they're being converted uh, to grow medical marijuana for individuals on a, on a personal license. Um, there's nothing that we can do in terms of uh, that component of it uh, to um, Member Gibson's question. What we can do in, and what we are doing is working to try and uh, understand if they're growing more plants than what they're licensed to grow. And the, uh, the grow operation that we recently were involved in in St. Catharines, thousands of plants over what they were allowed to grow. And unfortunately, that's kind of our um, 
our limitations um, right now in terms of uh, our enforcement efforts and working with Health Canada um, to find those situations where they're overgrowing. Quite frankly, the, the illegal grows that we used to see 10 years ago don't exist anymore because this is so lucrative. Uh, through you, Chair, just to follow up. Yeah, that was my, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, my main issue here is if we uncover a grow operation and we can determine through our bylaw inquiries that there is no medical license attached to that grow operation, do we as a police force, are we still out there aggressively taking down those grow ops or I don't Previously, I've seen experience where all the focus has gone on crack houses and, and opioids and that, and the marijuana was sort of like at the bottom of the food chain. And if you, you know, the team I was with, if we had a chance, we would go do a couple grows if we had time, but there were more heavier drugs uh, were more of the focus. Are we as a police force, is that our, our thought pattern on that? And that we're so busy with other heavier drugs that we're not able to look after the grow ops? Because let's face it, there are a lot of grow op operations out there, many of them medical, but I'm sure not all. Um, so if we were to uncover a grow op and we could determine that it did not have a medical license are we still in position of pursuing that, getting the warrant, et cetera, and taking that grow up down? Chief? Uh, so through you, Chair, uh, absolutely. And we have uh, two members who are seconded to the uh, uh, provincial cannabis team. Um, and so that's specifically what they, they um, do. Um, and, you know, it's not necessarily something that Niagara wants to be proud of, um, but we are, experiencing um, exponential growth in the number of um, grows that are occur occurring because we have such a, um, a rural area um, and um, such good experience uh, in, in agriculture in this area that it's become quite lucrative. Uh, and quite frankly, um, our experience has been that we're not seeing um, a lot of the traditional illegal grows that we used to see 10 years ago. Um, what we're seeing are people or individuals exploiting the medical stream of cannabis uh, grows because it is um, our only enforcement efforts are if the, if the individual is overgrowing because they're, they're permitted to grow their 2000 plants or whatever it is. There's a, there's a whole host of other things that are being done to um, when they're applying to Health Canada for their medical license, um, they're giving addresses that don't even exist within the municipality. Um, they're splitting the address so that it's 123 Main Street, 123A Main Street, 123B Main Street. And before you know it, you've got now 12 licenses that are at that same location and meanwhile, this, the municipality hasn't been consulted with and aren't even verifying to Health Canada that those addresses exist. So it's, it's a significant problem um, and Health Canada uh, certainly bears uh, the, uh, the large responsibility for this problem. Uh, thank you. And through Chair, just a, a comment. Um, we're experiencing like everybody else, uh, like I say, we have seven operations are all in old greenhouses. I hear constantly from the neighbors, uh, the house value is devalued of $100,000, $200,000 because they're 200 yards downwind from a, a, a greenhouse. Their house constantly stinks. Um, the Health Canada component of this, the ball has been dropped significantly and somehow we need to to get information or get the word out to the federal government health canada that something has to be done on their end to put some teeth into uh, the laws of how these uh, medical marijuana licenses are, are operated because um, 
I have one not far from me and periodically my house stinks. Uh, and I'm, you know, there's other people even closer and who are downwind all the time. And so this is something that I'm hoping that, you know, maybe through the Canadian Association of Chiefs of Police or through the region or provincially, we can uh, make noise. We have personally made noise to Health Canada and we have got not one return phone call, email or anything, nothing. It's like nothing exists to, to assist the, the good people who live around these greenhouses. It's like they're completely forgotten in this whole rollout of legalization of marijuana. So um, we're really looking for something here to be done on a national level to address this issue because right now she's the wild west of, of cannabis. Uh, as the chair said, uh, they're the same in Port Colburn. We, we're the same here in Wingfleet and it's just something's got to get done. So I don't know how we, we do that, um, but um, Maybe that's something that the Canadian Association of Chiefs of Police can push uh, to the uh, federal government, Health Canada. So anyway, my comment, uh, it's a big issue here in Wainfleet. I hear about it regularly. Uh, I smell it myself regularly everywhere I go. I know that where they all are and, and the, the smell is bad. And, you know, what's, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> what was once, uh, you know, a beautiful home is still a beautiful home, but it stinks. And they're all over the place. So major problem uh, it was only uh, rolled out you know half thought out so uh, i'm very disappointed in the way it's uh, been rolled out by the government but something needs to be done on that soon thank you thanks member gibson so so may i suggest that we um we can have uh, the the board itself and the chief and his staff along with uh, our executive director mrs reed um why don't we do a letter we can do a Health Canada letter, uh, include our MPs on this, the Niagara MPs, also include the region and the 12 municipalities. And then if we can, um, uh, the three of us at the region can urge uh, the other mayors and, um, and uh, municipal uh, regional councillors to speak with their uh, collective councils to, to almost make this a, a region wide push to the federal government because uh, Member Gibson, you're right. It, it, we're not alone in this as far as whether it's Waynefleet or Port Colborne or Niagara Falls, St. Catharines. It is an issue. Um, they seem to be better at the recreational marijuana and how facilities can operate and they seem to uh, um, act very quickly on those as opposed to the medical. Uh, why, I don't know. Um, but as the Chief said, you know, for somebody you know, should be growing maybe four plants or eight plants. And all of a sudden they've got 2000 on a municipal lot. It just doesn't make sense. So if I can suggest that, um, then we can move forward. Uh, Member Gale. Yeah, Chair, and, and just to add to that, if you want to put it in, I'll forward the email and the notice I got uh, from the citizens. If you want to put down as a result of a, a notice that Councillor Gale got uh, regarding a new proposed plant at uh, Mountain and Kaler, this came up that will cause press, I would think, for it too. Okay, we can do that. One might be coming, and I'll send that to, to Deb in a second. Okay, I had Member D'Angelo, the Member Eek. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, just through the to the Chief, um, I, I'm just gonna uh, go to a different angle of this. In terms of, um, and, and I know, because two people have told me this, because they, uh, they grow personal use marijuana, they've actually had it stolen from their property. Uh, do you, I don't know if you have the answers here because it's relatively new, but do you find that resources are now going towards like there's more break and enters because people are aware of these. So those that don't have licenses, uh, they just acquire by stealing someone else's uh, grow plants once they're ready. Um, do you see more enforcement going into there or do you see resources being spent on that uh, end of the uh, component, which is a little different than um, preventing it in the first place? Chief? Uh, so through your chair, I mean, we have seen some uh, some incidents um, where there has been uh, some violence attached to uh, those types of uh, scenarios. Um, you know, obviously, it's a, it's a very lucrative industry, and there's uh, uh, there's money attached uh, to those plants. Um, so we are seeing uh, we're seeing thefts, we're seeing uh, break and enters, we're seeing. Um, um, some of these uh, locations are 
uh, somewhat fortified, if you will, uh, with with guard dogs. Um, again, because of the uh, uh, the potential revenue that flows from these locations. Um, and just to clarify, with regards to the the medical stream, there really are two streams of medical. There is the the legal stream of of medical where licensed producers are growing medical cannabis and they're regulated. They, they have all of the um, uh, odor control measures in place. What we're talking about is the illegal uh, stream of the medical stream, if you will, that's been infiltrated and there are no odor controls. Um, it is, it is really a, uh, it's, it's unfortunate what's happened here because uh, there are no measures in place and, uh, and Health Canada, um, again, is, uh, has not been uh, um, very successful in being able to curtail this. And I'm hearing now that uh, unfortunately, um, we're one of, uh, I think the, the largest area in Ontario uh, where, um, where these illegal medical stream grows are occurring uh, within within here in Niagara. And it, you're right, uh, Chair, it's every single municipality across uh, the region is being impacted. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Uh, Member D'Angelo, is that, uh, that it? Yeah, I, I'm good. Because um, one of the selling features of um, decriminalizing marijuana was the, the reduction of uh, law enforcement resources towards the um, uh, grow ox now, <laughs> but it, it seems like it, there's no reduction there. We just have a different problem to deal with that's causing uh, usage of uh, resources. So that's uh, just my point. Thank you. Thank you. Member Eek? Oh, unmute yourself. <laughs> Very good. Okay. Thank you. Um, certainly, uh, I agree with the, the discussion that's been going on. I, uh, with respect to uh, the controls associated for both the medical marijuana licensees by the federal government, and a concern or issue on how to um, rationalize and control the unauthorized. This is not a new problem. I mean, I recall when I was Lord Mayor in Niagara on the Lake we had all of a sudden on Lakeshore Road, a pop-up of uh, medical marijuana um, authorized uh, industry. And uh, there was no input uh, from the municipalities and they hold all the cards associated. However, um, they put certain restrictions in, but they have no ability or have not put in an ability to control the licenses that they adhere to the responsibilities that was uh, legislated to them. Um, I, the question I, I, I have of the chief is, have or has the federal government given the police the authority to follow up on a basis to check licenses and to check sites that they uh, concur with the approval that those sites were given uh, because I know sometimes there's pushback. No, you can't. It's intrusion onto their rights. But do you, uh, Chief, have the right to um, go in and inspect and ensure that uh, the license is, uh, is, is appropriate and what is allowed is being administered? Chief? Uh, so through you, Chair, that responsibility uh, remains with Health Canada in terms of the regulation. Um, where we come into the enforcement component, again, is on the overgrowing piece. So anything above whatever they're licensed to grow is what we're able to enforce. Um, because, again, it's, it's the responsibility of Health Canada to ensure that they're adhering to their, their license uh, requirements. But Chief, how do you how do you uh, gain that knowledge that there's potential for overgrowing of unauthorized license numbers? Well, therein lies the problem. Quite frankly, it's it, these are 
These are very difficult investigations. They're very time consuming uh, for our investigators to gather enough intelligence and enough information to, to support getting a search warrant to, to convince uh, a justice of the peace that there is a, a criminal offense that's being committed there. And bearing in mind that there's a cycle for these plants and um, quite often it takes longer to gain the evidence than the cycle of the growth of the plant. So again, this is, this is the, uh, the challenge that we're, uh, we're up against. Thank you, Chief. I think you're exposing the, the exact uh, concerns that I have and have had for a number of uh, years that full control is still lies with the federal government who are not enacting and giving authority to others to uh, achieve the requirements that meet the uh, authorized um, the granting of licensing. For you to have to go through search warrants, this, that, and the other, I would, I would like to think that we could assist the federal government in when we are aware of a concern or issue that we would have the right to go on that property and inspect the license, inspect the premises to ensure compliance with the uh, federal government. And I don't think you have that clear authority and, and we just keep going around and around and around. And I, I do support the idea of sending a, a letter to the federal government, but my observance is six years hasn't produced an outcome that satisfies the needs of the residents in the areas of these facilities. And it's, it's unfortunate. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Member Eek. So, I mean, I, I, in essence, if we can get with the police services board, the region and the municipalities on board, I mean, when you've got a push of, of a whole entire regional area, um, hopefully it can, I mean, we do have two liberal MPs and two conservatives who are on the, on the, um, in the official opposition. So, uh, you know, if we get these guys moving on this and get them talking about it with their ministers and, and staff up there. So, um, so what I'll do is, is we'll have uh, the chief, Deb, and I sit down. We'll get this letter set up. Uh, we'll get it to the board to look at. Um, if you guys, uh, Bob's going to send in some information and um, uh, other members send that to, to Deb and then we can uh, put this out and then have a concerted um, uh, plan to include the region with the 12 municipalities uh, moving forward. So as a poll, because what I don't want to see, and, and, and Kevin knows about this, and, and obviously Henry and David being mayors before know about this, we don't want it going to, to any of the councils and all they do is just receive it. We actually want them to look at it, respond, and, and getting be included in this and have them also um, send information uh, to the members of parliament as well as uh, uh, Health Canada and the minister responsible. So um, if that's okay. Uh, I'll take that as direction if we could do that. That's, is that okay with all the members? Okay. All right. You're all set with that, Deb and Chief? You're okay? We'll put that together? Good. Thank you. Any other questions to the Chief? Seeing none, Chief, are you set? Yes, I'm, I'm done. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, moving on to presentations. We have one presentation today. It's a special recognition to Ken Ganzel, the former chair, vice chair, member of the Niagara Police Services Board. Uh, we have a video presentation to formally recognize Mr. Ganzel, uh, whose provincial appointment to the Niagara Regional Police Services Board expired on August the 31st, 2020. Uh, this video was pre-recorded due to COVID on October the 8th. Uh, given that the COVID-19 pandemic, the board has ceased its practice of holding in-person board meetings and is continuing to conduct its meetings virtually in keeping with provincial mandated requirements regarding the limited number of persons at gatherings. Um, so we'll, uh, we'll see the video, Deb can run that, and then uh, we'll go on from there. Uh, thank you for joining us today. My name is Bill Steele and I'm the acting chair of the Police Services Board. <coughs> Due to the COVID-19 restrictions, the board has decided to pre-record a video that we can present as part of our public board meeting. Today, the board and chief of police are recognizing our former chair, 
Vice Chair and Board Member Ken Ganzel. Mr. Ganzel was a long-standing board member who served with dedication and commitment since he was first appointed to the board by the provincial government on May 30th, 2012. He brought a wealth of knowledge and experience spanning 44 years in both uh, the public and private sectors involving information technology systems and infrastructure, as well as a background in project management, finance planning and administration, strategic business planning and organizational strategy. Mr. Ganzel is recognized as a specialist in cryptology and IT security within government and headed the IT security operations for the Office of the Chief Justice of Ontario and for the Ministry of the Attorney General prior to serving on the Police Services Board. Throughout his eight plus year tenure on the board, he committed uh, an enormous amount of time and energy to a number of extremely important pol uh, policing issues. He also served as committee chair for both the police facilities and information technology committee before his term concluded on August 31st of 2020. Ken, I know from a personal experience, the strong dedication and support you provided to the board and we're grateful for the num numerous contributions that you have made and your involvement in police governance and board discussions will be missed. You have served this board and the community with honor, integrity, and compassion. On behalf of the board, it is my pleasure to present you with a commemorative plaque and a gift as a token of our appreciation. Ken, if you want to come up and we'll social distance here. Yeah. So this is the plaque. It says, Kenneth A.W. Ganzel, in appreciation for your dedication and commitment to police governance and services chair, vice chair, and member of Regional Municipality of Niagara Police Services Board, May 30th, 2012 to August 31st, 2020. Yeah. Thank you thank very you much. Enough. Yes, thank you. And a token of our appreciation. You can open it when you get home. Okay. Thank you. Thank okay. you. Yeah. Thank you, Ken. I'd love to shake your hand, but we're not allowed to. No. <laughs> At this time, I would now like to call on uh, Chief Brian McCullough to make some remarks on behalf of the service. Chief. Thanks very much, uh, Acting Chair. Um, Ken. Welcome, and on behalf of the uh, Deputy Chiefs and the entire executive leadership team, I want to extend sincere thanks uh, to you for your long-standing dedication and commitment uh, in serving the Police Services Board these past eight years, and for dedicating nearly 45 years to advancing the police profession. As a board member, I can attest to the fact that you were always well-prepared, well-researched, and you always put a lot of time and energy into understanding the important issues of the day. Your subject matter expertise in relation to IT was certainly beneficial to the board and to the service with several key IT projects that were designed to enhance public safety in our community being advanced during your tenure on the board, including the new P25 radio system the Real-Time Operations Center, and the impending digital evidence management uh, system, just to name a few. So I, I, I'll keep my comments short, but on behalf of the service, I want to extend best, best wishes to you and to Karen for a long, healthy, and, and happy retirement, and best wishes in any future endeavors. Thank you. I've got just a, a small token of appreciation uh, for your time. I, I won't handle it. I'll, and again, I'll physically distance as well. But I understand that uh, you collect uh, flags and it, it would be, be an honor for us to present you with the uh, Niagara Regional Police Service flag and there's a certificate in, on, the, uh, on the desk as well. So. And it looks like you may have actually seen some uh, service outside. That is a brand new flag. It has, oh. one, it has not seen the, the light of day. That adds a certain amount of uh, authenticity to like it. Like a game worn jersey. Right, yeah. right. I have I have a few comments if I may. Is Go ahead. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chief. You're welcome. I've noticed there are some masks that somehow have a device behind them that allow you to actually 
carry out public speaking, but this one is not. Um, thank you, Chief, uh, sorry, thank you, Acting uh, Board Chair Steele, Chief McCullough, for this presentation today. It is extremely appreciated. It recognizes my retirement after 44 years, as you had mentioned, from a number of areas in the police and justice sector, including the eight years and a bit on the Niagara Regional Police Services Board and the last year and a half as the board's chair. I do want to take a few minutes to speak on a few things and perhaps touch on some of the highlights of my eight years on the board since my appointment back on May 2012. The board and the police service accomplished a number of important milestones in our history, these accomplishments that we all in Niagara should be proud of, and it's not just me, it was the board and it was the service that carried these out and put this in place. Back in 2015, the Mobile Crisis Response uh, Team, or MCERT, was established in St. Catharines. Um, we only have the one unit, and I know just from our conversations over the last several months, uh, it would be something that I would love to see expanded, and I think it would go to great, great uh, areas of support in, in uh, dealing with mental health issue. In 2016, Chief, you, you indicated we started the Real-Time Operations Center uh, just down the hall from this room here. Um, it was a major accomplishment in my opinion. It basically took this police service not only into the 21st century, but allowed us to provide more real-time analysis of, of events that are taking place to better uh, direct field units and to again improve our operational footprint here in Niagara. However, the biggest accomplishment in that year was the completion and relocation of this building headquarters here in two district to this facility in Niagara Falls, which was 215 square feet. It, was, it, is, it is now completed and is the home to approximately 600 members of the Niagara Regional Police Service. This project took over six years to complete because it started back in 2009. I would also like to point out that year that we actually got underway with the Niagara Regional Police Hub situation uh, table uh, and the formation of Port Hall in Port Colborne, which again was a, another part of, of trying to address uh, community issues and which are not always police issues, but in order to provide the right services to people. 2019 um, was the groundbreaking in June and shovels in the ground of a new St. Catharines One District building. After four years of redesigned budget adjustments, the building is now underway and it's my understanding that building will be completed sometime at the very end of this year. In 2019, the Communications Unit was also recognized as an accredited center of excellence for police communications, the first in Ontario, second in Canada, and only one of 20 organizations in the world to have such uh, recognition. I highlight that because my career in this police service in 1977 started in the Communications Unit. Um, However, also in 2019, we had an historic increase of 41 new officers, the largest increase of police officers in 49 years. These officers are to be hired in this year right now and prompted a major effort on myself to sell the budget on behalf of a service for approval at Regional Council. And I will say that got approved with only two dissenting votes. 2020 hit us hard with a pandemic in Niagara. In mid-March, police continue to do their job following a number of new health protocols which have become the new normal, at least here in the short term. The Police Services Board and the Police Service will be celebrating in 2021 its uh, 50th anniversary. But before I leave that one, one last item in 2021, after 50 years, or maybe I should say 49 years, the Niagara Regional Police Services Board has finally moved to a paperless or electronic platform for board meetings, minutes, and other uh, documentation. Um, which will have a major reduction on time and cost to the board and for the service. So what is the future here? What I see for the board and the service is so much has changed in the past 10 months. Both the police service will celebrate its 50th anniversary, as I pointed out, starting on January 1st of next year, having been formed on January 1st of 1971. The police service and the board will be a new environment, will be in a new environment that moves a lot faster than ever before. It will not be business as usual, and we have seen that even in the last several months. The board needs to be more involved in understanding policing in the current times by asking tough questions, dig into the why and what, what the operational requirements of the service are. The board needs to participate in more events and take a real interest in the Niagara Regional Police. They are our employees, so get to know them 
and we need them to know us so they understand what our role is. There will be extreme pressure on budget and overall financial uh, fiscal health, not only here in Niagara, but across Canada. The board and the service will face a number of issues in the coming years, some of which the board never thought we would ever have to deal with. It will require everyone to be involved. Changes in the Safer Ontario Act that replaces the Ontario Police Act will have an impact on how police does business in the years to come as well. The service will, put, will face unprecedented demands, not just for police service, but to recognize our way of doing business. Change is inventable. Uh, but we will need to make the right decisions and not just for, not decisions just for change themselves. Mental health is going to be a, an impact and how we address that. Uh, the board must continue to ensure the following have priorities going forward, at least in the next five years, and these are critical to the board and service operational direction. Keep the business plan current. Ensure that the technology plan is kept current and in lockstep with the business plan. Use these plans to hold the police executives accountable and deliverables of the plan. That is your only basic yardstick that you have. Ensure that new technology is looked at for all areas of policing. We will need to be more efficient with our finite human resources and also be aware of, uh, also be aware of its central records. Computer aided dispatches, dispatch systems were installed in 2001. That's 20 years. And now consideration should be given as to replacement in the, of these systems going forward in the next uh, year or two. Buildings, we're pretty good on buildings, but there is one more building. The original building or strategic plan in 2009 talked about construction of an emergency service base of operations slash training center. And if I recall, there's an allocation and capital budget in 2023 for this building. Um, the board will need to understand policing needs of an agri community and ensure that these needs are addressed by an adequate and effective delivery of police service through accomplishments and goals of its business plan. So I'm, I'm going back to the business plan as one of the, the underpinnings of, of the operations and how we function as a board. I thank everyone here, uh, uh, Bill, uh, Brian, uh, I see our, our deputy chief, Brett, has joined, uh, another Niagara Laker. Um, I thank you for the opportunity to address everyone today, and I wish everyone good health going forward. And I also want to uh, thank Deb Reed and Don Saihaki for their work in the board office and support of me and being ch uh, chair for, for the last eight and, and uh, eight plus years. So thank you again, everyone. Ken, on behalf of the board, myself, our staff, and all the members of the police service, we thank you for all your years. Uh, this concludes our presentation, and we wish Ken much happiness in his future endeavors. Thank you very much. Okay, very good. So this time, I have uh, Member Gibson uh, and Member McKendrick move this uh, presentation to be received. Any questions or comments? Seeing none, anyone opposed? That's carried. On to our consent, consent agenda. We have items 157 through item 163. Moved by member uh, D'Angelo, seconded by member Eek that the information be received. Any questions on any of the consent items? Uh, member Eek. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Uh, with respect to report uh, 158, that is the Niagara Regional Police Services authorized strength as of October 1st, 2020. And I noticed in the report that the authorized service was 1,087 and the actual was 1,071, a slight deficiency. I was most pleased to uh, hear the chief when he updated us on his report at the start of the meeting and, and spoke to the fact that uh, 18 new constables have now been uh, trained and graduated as of September the 25th. And I'm wondering that's 
18 out of an approval of 40 men or women um, for 2020. And I'm just curious as to uh, what the plan may reflect to uh, bring into the fold the additional approved uh, constables in order that we uh, may have actual service equal to the authorized service. So uh, perhaps uh, through you to the chief, you may have a comment on, on that plan. Chief? Uh, through you, Chair, uh, our uh, recruiting unit uh, continues uh, diligently to, uh, to hire um, both recruits um, and currently serving members uh, where they're available to us. Um, where our plan is to have an additional 20 officers um, more if we can get them. Uh, but at, at this point in time, our plan is for 20 at um, the January intake uh, at the Ontario Police College and an additional 20 uh, in uh, the April uh, intake, recognizing that uh, we're likely to see some uh, retirements in the early part of next year. Uh, and with those two combined intakes, um, minus any retirements that we see in the interim, uh, we're hoping to be able to achieve our, our actuals at that point in time. Number eight. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Chief. I'm, I'm most pleased to hear that because uh, I know all our board members want to make sure that uh, your staffing is appropriate and that it meets the authorized levels. And so with those actions that you've just outlined, I'm sure that we're going to reach that. So I, I thank you very much for that information. Thank you, Member Reek. Uh, Member D'Angelo. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, I just had a couple questions on item 157. That's the, um, the uh, District 1 update. Uh, ju just a couple questions. One is, uh, I'm just getting to the right page here. It, it's actually regarding uh, headquarters. I, I see there's appendix two uh, or appendix one uh, talks about the parking lot expansion. And it talked about the procurement for construction closed on October 9th. But what was delaying this was uh, a lease with uh, Hydro One um, is there any update on that? Um, because we're starting to run out of time for construction purposes of uh, rectifying the parking issues at uh, headquarters. So I'm just wondering if anyone has an update on if the lease has been agreed to and how quickly they can move with the construction uh, considering the tenders closed. Chief? Uh, so through you, uh, uh, Chair, uh, kind of timely. Uh, in, in fact, I just... Uh, um, was conversing with uh, staff at the region yesterday and learned uh, that they have um, come to an agreement with the lease with um, Hydro One. They've signed uh, their uh, copy of the lease and they're waiting for a fully executed copy of the lease to be returned uh, from Hydro One within 10 days. Uh, the tender went out for the, uh, for the additional parking lot uh, I don't know who the um, the successful contractor was, but uh, my understanding is that they have awarded um, the contract to uh, to a vendor. Um, and I actually have a meeting tomorrow with uh, regional staff uh, to confirm timelines because I know we're running into that uh, that crunch uh, where um, the asphalt companies uh, closed down for the winter. Uh, and we're obviously um, uh, would like to see that, uh, that uh, parking completed before year end, or at the very least have it uh, um, a layer of uh, gravel so that we can utilize the additional parking and perhaps uh, um, complete the asphalt portion in the, uh, in the spring. But um, I should be in a better position to uh, provide an update and comment on this, on the timelines uh, following my meeting tomorrow. Uh, thank you, uh, through you, Chair. Thank you, Chief, for the update. That's excellent. 
Uh, the other point uh, I just wanted to talk about that report now, it goes back to the uh, uh, District 1 building. Uh, they talk about being over budget and they talk about the uh, furniture and uh, equipment being over budget also um, within that scope. Have, and again, this is I'm just throwing this out there. So they're trying to look for remedies to bring that back into budget. Have they looked at and again, I'm not sure what's in the current building, but can any of that furniture equipment be repurposed in the new building? Um, because I'm sure some of it still has uh, capable use. Uh, it probably hasn't expired fully. I, I know they want to make sure everything's nice and new in the new building, but at the time when you're over budget, they may have to look at something like that to get them through uh, to the time where that equipment or furniture needs to be replaced. Uh, just if anyone has any uh, information on that, that'd be quite helpful. Chief? Uh, through you, Chair, uh, we are uh, meeting next week uh, of the steering committee to discuss uh, the, the various uh, mitigation strategies. Um, the, uh, uh, the equipment at one district, it, it's a very tired building and uh, a lot of the furniture in that building is also quite tired. So uh, I'm not certain that that's one of the mitigation strategies that we'll consider. Um, but obviously, uh, we'll look at uh, a number of options and, uh, and mindful of the budget uh, component as well. Yeah, thank you. That's, that's all right now. Um, for that particular item, I do have a question on another report, but I don't know if anyone else has questions on this report. Uh, I don't see any. Do you want to continue to do your next one? Yeah, I can do that. It's, it's item... Um, 162 the annual report community-based uh, crime prevention um, just uh, one of the items that sort of caught my eye in there is I know um, the Welland district works with Niagara College in terms of doing some extra patrolling around the college um, I didn't see that in the uh, district one which is St. Catherine Storrow is there any additional patrolling that's done uh, in areas that are uh, heavily intensified by students in the uh, Thorold area in Southern St. Catharines. Like, is any additional resources uh, put into there uh, to mitigate some of the problems we have with students in the student housing issue with the over density of them and like parties and other things? I know this year hasn't been as bad as past years because not all the students are here and they're doing it online. But has there been any uh, work done on that? I didn't see it in the report, but maybe it just didn't make the report. Thanks. Hey, Chief? Uh, through you, Chair, and, and um, you're quite right. Um, there's a number of other initiatives. It's not a, an all-inclusive, um, everything that we're doing um, uh, snapshot uh, of, of across the service. Uh, but I can assure you that um, we have a great partnership uh, working collaboratively with, um, uh, with Brock University and with the city of uh, Thorold. Uh, and also with uh, the Brock uh, Student Union, BUSU, um, recognizing, of course, that uh, there are or have been a number of uh, concerns raised in the past. Uh, and uh, we do our best to um, put out additional patrols, work proactively with, um, uh, with the, uh, the, the uh, students going door to door uh, when we catch wind of, uh, of parties and uh, uh, um, Particularly, we see them around certain times of the year, Halloween being one of them. Um, of course, uh, St. Patty's Day, all of uh, some key events, usually around the Frosh Week, et cetera. Uh, so um, we keep our ear to the ground, monitoring social media, et cetera. And, uh, and we do proactively uh, work with uh, our partners in, in addressing those concerns. Okay, Member D'Angelo. <laughs> Oh, sorry. No, uh, uh, Deputy yeah. Chief Deputy Chief Flynn has a comment on this. Sorry, sure. thank you, Chair. And uh, just to uh, uh, add on to the Chief's comments and uh, for uh, Member D'Angelo's awareness, uh, back in June, we also uh, prepared a report, which actually for the first year was a combined report, which uh, combined problem-oriented policing and community patrol uh, to speak to the board's uh, bylaws 191 and 193. Uh, this is another iteration, bylaw 192, that's very close to the same, but I just wanted to let you know that uh, back in June when we did report uh, on those two other issues, that the first two or three um, uh, issues with respect to one district 
um, was Project Impact, which is a partnership program between Brock, uh, DSPN, um, sorry, not uh, Project Impact. Uh, the next one was St. Cath- Patrick's Day 2019, uh, which does uh, look at that area, uh, as well as the South End Noise Patrol and off-campus uh, efforts that, uh, that the organization took. Um, you know, sort of in conjunction and collaboration with. And uh, I think there was probably some others in those reports as well. Uh, it is a bit of repetition, so not everything makes every one of those reports. So thank you, and my apologies for cutting in there. Oh, no problem, Deputy Chief. Thank you. Uh, oh, yeah. Uh, well, no, thanks for those answers. No, I appreciate that. Um, it's just uh, sometimes it's good to repeat that because it is an issue here in Thorold and St. Catherine. So when you can tell the residents that there is some proactive work being done. Uh, I know they had the good neighbor program, but probably didn't run it this year because of COVID. Uh, and I know that's participating with politicians and police officers and other uh, uh, members of, um, uh, uh, of, of Thorold and St. Catharines that promote that. So I, I'm just trying to bring some awareness that there is proactive stuff that's there. And that's why I brought it up and asked a few questions. So thank you, uh, Chair. That's it for me for the uh, consent agenda. Good. Thank you. Uh, Member Gibson. Thank you, Chair, through you. Uh, Chief, I just want to come back to the um, implementation of 18 new officers out on the street. Um, I don't want, I'm not going to put you on the spot here, but uh, I just wonder, some of the public may be looking at that and wondering, you know, how representative of the community are those 18 officers in regards to different groups? Um, could you just briefly, and I know the answer to this, but just for the public, could you just briefly touch upon our efforts to ensure that um, we are hiring people representative of the entire community, uh, BIPOC, uh, all that sort of uh, area? Chief? Uh, so through you, Chair, uh, our, uh, our recruiting unit um, engages with uh, the various universities. They do different uh, job fairs and, and whatnot. And, and uh, we work closely with our um, Chief of Police and uh, Community Inclusion Council uh, to try and uh, um, best we can at least um, ensure that the, uh, the members that we uh, hire are representative of our community. Um, our recruiting unit has also held um, uh, particular um, recruiting events uh, for women specifically to try and uh, encourage and, um, and, and have uh, women consider the law enforcement profession um, where they may not have uh, previously in the past. And, and that's certainly the, um, the experience that we've seen with some of the uh, uh, communities, um, um, some, some of the, uh, the BIPOC communities where um, they may not necessarily have considered policing in the past, and we're doing our best to try and uh, leverage uh, some of the members of, of our BIPOC community that we currently have within our service um, to uh, assist with those recruiting drives and to assist with uh, showing the members of those communities um, that it does represent an opportunity for uh, for their members of their community to consider. Um, so each um, recruiting drive is, is uh, really trying to uh, focus and, and uh, target their efforts on, on not only um, solid, uh, well-rounded, experienced recruits, um, but also looking at uh, ensuring that we're um, doing the best we can to hire people that uh, are representative of our community. Thank you, Chief. I just, uh, it was good to put that out there again with 18 more officers coming onto the street here, especially in light of the fact that we just signed the, you know, throughout the region, the inclusive uh, um, act there um, to make sure that uh, we are all acting as inclusive as possible. So our efforts are, uh, are good and I thank you for that. That's my comments, thank you. Thank you, Member Gibson. Uh, any other questions? Member McKendrick, any questions? No? Okay. Uh, Councillor Gale did step away. I know he had another uh, important uh, issue to take care of. He will be back. Um, so seeing no further questions, 
This is moved by uh, member D'Angela and seconded by member Eek that the information be received. Uh, anyone opposed to these? That's carried. Thank you. On to new business. First item is item 164, City of St. Catharines, City Council Motion, Niagara Regional Police Services Operation, loud and clear. Moved by Councillor uh, Gibson, or sorry, yes. Uh, moved by Councillor Gibson, seconded by Councillor D'Angela, that the information be received and further that the item be referred to the Chief of Police for consideration to expand the Niagara Regional Police Services Operation, loud and clear to one district, St. Catharines. Any questions on this? Chief, any comments? Uh, just uh, through you, and I think I covered it off during my initial uh, um, remarks um, where, where uh, I spoke to the, the uh, media release that uh, we did on this project. Um, it was an initiative that was driven, uh, and we, we really try to encourage our members at the local level um, based on the feedback that they're getting from their community to uh, develop um, community-oriented community uh, policing initiatives um, that address those concerns. So that, this is something that we can certainly um, push down to our, our officers uh, in one district uh, and have them uh, uh, work towards uh, uh, addressing the same uh, concerns uh, that are now Oh, expressed in this uh, this letter from uh, St. Catharines. Thank you, Chief. Any questions? Seeing, oh, sorry, Member D'Angelo. Uh, thank you, Chair. I just want to make the point. I know it, it. The letter comes from the City of St. Catharines, but District One also covers Thorold, and I know there's. Ex I hear it myself. There's excessive noise with vehicles, so I'm hoping when they do look at that, they look at the whole district as a whole when they're looking at this program. Uh, just not uh, um, basing um, it on the St. Catharines letter. That's that's just my point. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Member D'Angela, and I concur with the Chief. I think if this is um, all districts are included in this uh, through the Chief's office, it'll make a difference across Niagara. And and it is kind of uh, ironic that, that that this is coming forward at this time. And it's be, to be quite honest, I believe it's due to the pandemic. People are home working, and, and we've had calls at City Hall here in Port Coburn where uh, there, the people are saying, gosh, it's so loud in my neighborhood. Well, they're normally away at work. They don't hear the construction or the trucks and the busyness of a day, and people think it's you know it's so loud but uh, uh, because they're not normally around. But there has been a huge increase, uh, as the chief mentioned earlier, in vehicles without mufflers or... Um, uh, or people have changed their vehicles uh, uh, with louder mufflers or, or motorcycles and things like that. So uh, we are garnering more complaints, I think, during the pandemic than we ever had uh, prior to this. So, Chief, uh, uh, I do applaud your staff for doing this, but and I do look forward to it being rolled out across the region. Uh, seeing no further questions, uh, anyone opposed to this? And it's carried. Item 165, Niagara Police Services Board, Board Bylaw 386-2020, Missing Persons. Moved by Member McKendrick, seconded by Member D'Angela. That the Board adopt Bylaw 386-2020 as appended to this report. And further, that the Acting Board Chair and Executive Director be authorized to execute the required documentation. Any questions on this? Comments from staff? Seeing none, anyone opposed? That's carried. Item 166, Niagara Police Services Board, uh, Bylaw 387-2020, use of board issued equipment and technology. Moved by uh, Member Eek, seconded by Member McKendrick, that the board adopt a bylaw 387-2020 as appended to this report and further the acting board chair and executive director be authorized to execute the required documentation. Any questions? Any re any response from staff? Seeing none, anyone opposed? That's carried. 167, Special Fund Request, Canadian Association of Police Governance, moved by Member Gibson, seconded by Member McKendrick, that the board continue its sponsorship in the amount of $1,000 from the Special Fund to the Canadian Association of Police Governance, the CAPG, in support of its 2020 virtual conference and annual general meeting. Any questions from members? Member Eek. 
Take your mute off. Your mute's on. Probably most people would rather I have my mute on, but we'll ignore <laughs> that. <laughs> um, uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to speak to this. And it really furthers what you spoke to in your opening remarks regarding um, um, conventions and associations. In this case here, it's the uh, um, Canadian Association of Police Governance. And often when I was involved in politics, people, particularly the publics who may be viewing this, always want to know what the benefits are and, and, and the knowledge gained. And not so sure that this is just a fun thing to go off. And, and I just would like to read a few comments from the literature that that we have before us very briefly and that really dispels that and on what we do try to gain from a knowledge aspect. Uh, the theme of this year's conference is prioritizing wellness through governance. And as we progress through calls for defunding police, a focus on systematic racism, issues around police wellness checks, compounded by the current COVID-19 health pandemic, it all adds up to the public and police that are stressed, overwhelmed, and looking for answers. The pandemic forced the CAPG to shift from an in-person experience to a virtual platform. We adapted our programs, sought out experts to assist us in finding the best technology and platforms to allow our members to learn and network and have the opportunities to engage in a meaningful way. And so I, I just want to express that uh, those people who attend these really do find a great benefit that serves the community. And, and I'll leave it at that, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Member Eek. Any further questions? Anything from staff? Seeing none? No, I think thanks. You're all right, Chief? Yes, thanks. Okay, thank you. Uh, anyone against opposed to this? Seeing none, that's carried. Item 168, special fund request out of the cold dinner program. It's moved by member DeAngelis, seconded by member Eek, that the board approve a donation in the amount of $500 from the special fund to the out of the cold program. Any questions with regards to this item? Any comments from staff? Uh, just that uh, this is something uh, that uh, we do on an annual basis and uh, would like to uh, continue uh, to have the board support in uh, pushing this initiative forward. Thank you, Chief. Seeing uh, no further comments or questions, is anyone opposed to this? So that's carried. And just to remind uh, those that are on line, Chief, the special fund, can you explain where that comes from? Because uh, I just want to make sure that everyone knows it's not taxpayer dollars. So, uh, yes, thank you. Uh, the prop property that uh, comes into our possession um, uh, that is, um, we're not able to find uh, the lawful owners um, in accordance with the uh, Police uh, Service Act um, were uh, required to uh, have that property sold through auction and the funds that come uh, from that from the sale go into the special fund uh, for that purpose. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, we are now on to other new business. The two items 169 and 170 are in camera reports and these are now for public release from the September the 24th 2020 confidential meeting. First item is 169, Police Services Board Draft Operating Budget for 2021. C-169, Police Services Board Draft Operating Budget for 2021. That's moved by uh, Member Gibson, seconded by Member McKendrick, that in accordance with the board direction, the amended report be received for public information. Any questions on this? Comments from staff? Nothing, thanks. Thank you. Anyone opposed to this one? That's carried. Item 170, Special Investigations Unit, the SIU, public reporting. 
Uh, it refers to item C-159 from the Special Investigations Unit, SIU, case number 19-OCI-311. This is moved by Member McKendrick, seconded by Member D'Angela, that in accordance with board direction, the above noted report be received for public information. Any questions on this one? Any comments from staff? Just a normal procedure where it would have been, the board would have seen this in confidential and this is just now putting it into uh, to, to the public domain. Perfect, thank you, Chief. Uh, seeing no further questions or comments, is anyone opposed to this? This is carried. So before I adjourn, uh, we'll take a 10 minute break and then we have to um, log out of this and log into the next uh, meeting. So with that said, this meeting is now adjourned. Thank you. See you in 10 minutes. <laughs>